So your your dad didn't. You said your dad his music was just for fun. He, what did he do for a living? Oh boy, he was. Uh, I'll take a little little background. He was a class of 1912 at Puno, and mother was class of 14. His mother went to. Dad's mother went to Puno. She's class of 1887, oh, I think it was. Yeah. Wow. So we go way back there. And in 1912, he knew he wanted to be an electrical engineer. He's already playing around with the Morse code on the dot dash keyboard with a friend who lived in New Wano Valley, corresponding. So when he graduated, he, and he was, a, was a brilliant student. I think he graduated with honors. He decided he wanted to go to Cornell University way back in Ithaca, New York, because they had a very good engineering school. So no airplanes, boat to San Francisco, train to New York. When he graduated in 16, World War I had started. Instead of coming all the way back to Honolulu, he thought the U.S. should be helping the British and the French and volunteered to go to England to be trained as a, a pilot in the forerunner of what's today the RAF. It was the mm -hmm. Royal Flying Corps in those right. days. So he got his wings there and we have photos of him. And then when we got in, he switched over. And one day he and his flight leader were at the dawn, up early, up early flying over the battle lines, I guess. And they saw five German planes down below and indicated they didn't have any radios, they didn't have parachutes. Uh, attack, you know. So Dad followed the guy down and apparently the flight leader shot at them and ran for home. Mm -hmm. And Dad thought he was supposed to shoot them down so he was tangled with five hornets, as he said. <laughs> he could have been killed right then and there. He said he got a bullet through the soft part of his leg, another one creased his back, and they finally shot his engine out, but he was able to control it and land it behind German lines and wow. was captured and put in a hospital. And officers were treated with respect in those days, so I think they took pretty good care of him and healed him. And then he was put in a cell with three other Americans and one night they found they could wiggle the tiles loose and decided to escape. Four of them went out about midnight, and as Dad's stories go, they had to swim a dark river. They didn't know where the crocodiles were in or what was in it. And two of the four got recaptured. Dad and his friend were hidden during the day and fed and sent on their way at night for three months wow. through Germany and Belgium to get into Holland, which was neutral. And he wrote this up in, in a monthly serial story in McClure's magazine, which is sort of the Saturday evening post of the day. And he called it uh, Shot with Luck, and one of the chapters was the Dawn Patrol. Once he got to Mo, Belgium, uh, he was hiding with his friend in a church in the woods, and somebody came and discovered them, and Dad learned to speak German in uh, Punahou School. Mm -hmm. And he said they were Americans, but the area was occupied by Germans. So this guy wanted to go and get somebody who could speak English, a guy named uh, Gustav Hus, H-U-S. Dad looked all these families up back, back in the 50s and went back to thank them. And he arranged to harbor the two of them there till they could arrange for somebody to come with rubber boots and rubber gloves and go out at midnight into the forest and cut the electric wires and tell them to run to freedom. So he got back to uh, England just as World War I was ending and all his family knew here was he was missing in action. They didn't know whether he was dead or alive. So when he um, got coming back, he had a flying buddy there named Paul Winslow. Later invited Paul Winslow to Hawaii to meet his family. And Winslow fell in love with his younger sister, Ruth, and became our Uncle Paul for the rest of our oh, lives. Wow. And I was just relating that he was one of the first managers of the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, which opened in 27. And one of the hot shots that came there was Samuel S. F. B. Morse, who developed Pebble Beach, the golf mm -hmm. course, and all that expensive real estate. And he's looking for young guys to help him and offered Paul Winslow the opportunity to join him. And he didn't want to mention it to Ruth because she was island boy and girl. And and she heard about it. So, Why didn't you tell me? Let's do it. So, mm -hmm. so they went there and had a wonderful life. He stayed his whole career as an executive with Morse in developing that. And she became the principal uh, broker for the Del Monte properties. Mm -hmm. And she'd come out here to lunch when she was still alive and 
my wife was in real estate to help pay the kids tuition at Punahou. My brother Bob's was, my sister Pam was. She'd hear our, the girl's story about real estate. And she said, I take my hat off to you girls. You not only find the buyer, you sell the property. <clears throat> then you got to get them the financing at the bank. All my deals are for cash, whether they're 500000 or $5 million. She was de <laughs> dealing with Crosby and Firestone and Bob Hope and all those guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how did Dad get started in the music then? So then what Dad finally uh, did, <laughs> he met mother of all things. It's crazy success stories these people had. When she was 17 at Punahou, Mrs. Louise Dillingham, Walter Dillingham's wife, heard her sing and thought she had a remarkable lyric soprano and knew that Madame Melba, the big opera star of the world, was coming through from Australia in a ship and arranged an audition for Melba to hear the little 17-year-old Margaret Leith Center. Mm. And um, she was so knocked, knocked away by this voice, she went to her mother and said, I want to take your daughter to live with me in my house as my protege and teach her to be in, for the opera in Europe. So all during World War I, when Dad was off there, she was out in Australia. So at the end of the war, she came back here on her way to Europe mm -hmm. and met Dad at parties, heard about his escape story, and said, uh, I'm going to be giving three concerts before I leave, one on Kauai, one on Oahu, and one on Maui. Why don't you come along and tell your escape story in the intermission? And he, <laughs> he did, and a romance bloomed. They wanted to get married, but uh, he so he worked so hard on this, go give it a try, mm -hmm. we'll get married later. But she got as far as New York City, and of course no airplanes then either, before taking the ship to Europe, <clears throat> was having second thoughts about missing dad, I guess. And there happened to be a minister from, of all things, St. Andrew's Cathedral over here. And she went to him for advice, and uh, the base, bottom line was, uh, Peggy, follow your heart, and that letter back to dad, when I was a bad little boy, I can remember seeing her finger point, to think I gave up my career for you. <laughs> <laughs> so for the music part, here yeah. she was highly trained in music, right. and Dad started writing things at Punahou. Yeah. The, the song the kids sing at the football game is called Go Punahou. He wrote that when he was there. Yeah. And then uh, his father was a, an organ player, and his grandfather, Alexander Young, was quite a Scottish poet. So we think he inherited his music and his lyrics from those two sources. So did he so compose on the piano or on the guitar? On the piano. On the piano. He played guitar and he played ukulele, played mandolin back at Cornell, yeah. was always in the glee clubs, always loved music. But then the, what he finally did, mother being in New York and he being here, they somehow communicated and agreed to meet in Chicago at the Winslow mm -hmm. place to get married. And once that was done, he got a job with one of the first factories to build refrigerators. Everybody had an ice man bring a block of ice to your mm -hmm. ice box. And um, they worked, he worked there in that company for about two years. Brother Bob was born there in Chicago in 21. In 23, they came back to Honolulu, and I was born here in 24. And um, Dad brought refrigeration, the first refrigeration to Hawaii and was headed up the Von Ham Yum Company, which is a family corporation, in developing, selling everybody refrigerators. So I remember at this, um, Dad had the good fortune of being healthy until 101. Mm. He finally died at 101. And at the church, the Refrigeration Association of Hawaii brought in this huge refrigerator draped in lays in memory of the man who brought refrigeration to Hawaii. So he was responsible for developing that in the family company and then into air conditioning, all in the electrical field. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, writing songs that uh, were becoming very, very popular. And old Uncle Conrad von Ham, being a hard-working German and head of the company, called him in one day and said, Andy, in his German accent, I think with all the songs you're writing, you're not paying attention to business. <laughs> Dad said, very smartly, Uncle Conrad, when you and Aunt Bernie are playing bridge, that's when I'm writing my songs. <laughs> 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 
So anyway, I guess one of the early ones was popular was the cockeyed mayor of Kaunakakai. And then the big one that hit, of course, in 1939, Lovely Hula Hands. Lovely And then in the, in the, in the 50s, came up with that Melikiliki Maka. Mm -hmm. And just happened to have Bing Crosby in time, town at that time. And he knew Bing very well. And he, Bing was out in the family courtyard having a drink with Dad, and they were playing ukuleles and singing. And and Dad said, I've got a new song. Let me play it for you, see what you think of it. Uh, with Meli Kalikimaka. And he said, you know, I'm going back. I'm going to be recording White Christmas with the Andrews sisters. And can I put that on the flip side? <laughs> so Dad was just delighted to get this <laughs> kickoff on Meli Kalikimaka. Yeah. Wow. And so he just... And then it would be special occasions where um, the Chinese Narcissus Festival every year uh, would ask him to write a song for them. And the Japanese have the annual Cherry Blossom Festival. So he did these, they actually had a little Chinese flavor in the music. And I remember some of the lyrics in that Chinese song was, I think it was Pretty Girl from Old Cathay ancestors came here to stay now she does hawaiian way with her gentle hula sway <laughs> he was amazing with some of the and then i think one of the prettiest ones that a lot of people love is a uh, weave a lay of stars for you yeah. and that was just one of these things that came by when somebody was going to dinner at mother and mother and dad's house and Makalei place and ask what does Makalei mean? Maka is an eye and a lay, lay of eyes that thought of a lay of stars and mm -hmm. it came up with that one. And it was fun with that musical connection. I remember very clearly when Lawrence Welk was in town with his musical director and his wife and they were invited to dinner and my young bride and I were invited there to dinner too and sister Pamela had an um, an accordion and of course Lawrence had to play the accordion and next thing you know they're all dancing the polka all over the living room <laughs> 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 so it was a wonderful partnership between mother and dad and we were lucky kids to come along and see him yeah. at the piano playing something and then writing this business up and I was I was I was telling Kyle that uh, his little hobby he was really a businessman working for the family company and then uh, on a lot of different boards and as things developed like the first Rotary Club he became president of the Rotary Club and then the overall once a year there is a chairman of all the Rotary Clubs mm -hmm. and he he was that at one time um, members of the some military groups and It's a wonder that we ever saw him home for dinner, but he was always there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the uh, reminiscences about your father, R. Alex Anderson.